looks like we've got some Aussies here. I love the chat because even if I don't get to per uh, participate, I know you guys will encourage one another and it will, we'll help each other. So uh, let's kick it off, shall we? Thanks for the patience. Let me find the presentation. See if you can see this. Can you see um, yes. my slide speech to print? Yes. Okay, welcome everybody. As Donna said, I'm from Reading Simplified. And Reading Simplified is a so-called speech to print approach. And ever since I ran across the ideas that have um, helped me teach kids how to read in the, in the 90s, I've been wondering what exactly is this approach because it didn't really have a name and um, I'm not the only one. So there are other people that have been discussing this issue of this is kind of different from maybe some mainstream programs, particularly the print to speech approach. And, what is the difference? And um, and this um, has kicked up a lot more interest lately. As far as I'm aware, it kind of like really got um, kicked off when Nora Shabazi from Ebley did a presentation on speech to print, maybe in the spring. And I've been talking with her and Donna and some other people that are the, like working with a lot of different programs. To, to kind of think about this concept of what would what is a this speech to print approach and so that is what I want to talk about today is there a third way is there something different is it even worth talking about and um, so this whole thing I would love for you to consider it a very exploratory so um, I am not an expert on all the other reading programs out there I'm I'm not a historian, but some of the things that I'm going to share are going to be uh, my interpretation of various reading programs and some history. But this is just uh, really to get the conversation um, not starting, because like I said, it's already been going on, but to kind of continue it and see if we can get a little bit more refinement. And in fact, some of the refinement that we're going to be seeing if we can get your opinion on is, do we want to call it speech to print? Do we, maybe this name that Nora, of, Nora Shabazi of Ebley came up with, speak, spell, read, might be a better name. Um, so what is the name? <laughs> um, people have, you may have signed up here because you saw it said speech to print and you didn't know what that meant, or maybe you did. Um, and the, what we've been dis discovering is when we look into the, if there's anything written about it, which there's not much. And when there is, there are different interpretations. And so to many people that we talk to, speech to print means encoding. Yes, I do dictation and, um, uh, that is definitely one angle on the term speech to print, but it doesn't really represent what my experience is teaching a different way from mainstream phonics and also what some of my colleagues have been experiencing. So we're, it doesn't fully, in other words, represent what we're trying to display. Um, another thing that comes up when people hear speech to print, of course, is Dr. Louisa Moat's book. And although she has a really pivotal quote in there, which we were going to talk about, and she's sh showing a principle that is the speech to print principle. Um, there are also other things in that book that we're not necessarily talking about, and we might mean more than that. So speech to print doesn't necessarily um, hit the bullseye. And then in the UK and Australia, a lot of programs that use this approach, uh, they're called linguistic phonics. And that also works to some extent, because we're talking about the orientation of language. Um, and that's how we learn to read that written language is built off of speech. Um, but in the 50s, 60s, there were programs developed, I think mostly in the UK and rather in the US that were labeled a linguistics approach, which meant studying the rhyme and looking more at the whole word. So that's not what we're talking about, which we'll get into. Maybe you've heard of sounds to print. That's kind of a variation on speech to print. Um, that's had a little less traction, but we're thinking maybe maybe we could rename it Speak, Spell, Read because we're talking about first the child comes to the task of reading, having garnered hopefully the spoken language. So speak and then we draw from that onto them deducing the code and, and how it works through spelling and they, they um, access the sounds that they hear in word to represent them um, in print and then that moves into reading. And this is all interrelated, as we know. So those are some of the things that we have been debating. And I would love to hear what you guys think as we continue on today. 
I thought this was kind of timely. It's kind of, Dr. Timothy Shanahan just wrote this a couple days ago, I think. Um, and it shows something that's kind of that makes this discussion tricky. I'll get into the quote in a minute, but basically, if you Google speech to print or, or go to Google Scholar and look at speech to print or look at linguistic phonics, you don't see a clear cut definition across all sorts of places like research journals and per literacy leaders books. And it's just not clear. And uh, I think it's partly because we haven't had researchers studying the minutia or the nuances of phonics approaches. And that just hasn't been um, for without the negative connotation, it hasn't been a fad lately. So here's one way that uh, Dr. Shanahan framed it. He said, I remember back in the 70s and 80s, the federal government invested heavily in research on reading comprehension. That produced a lot of terrific studies. And for a while, it dominated the reading journals, both the research journals and those aimed at practitioners. How many of you have been around long enough to remember that or remember what happened afterwards? Uh, which is where, you know, when I went into grad school in 1980, it was nearly impossible, he says, to find a contemporary high quality article on phonics teaching. The comprehension researchers weren't anti-phonics, they just sucked all the oxygen out of the room. A beginning teacher at that time would have thought the only thing she was supposed to teach was comprehension strategies. So I just use this as like a little kind of glimpse onto the fact that researchers study different things at different times based on different reasons. And just because we don't have it really clear cut now doesn't mean it's not worth pursuing. And there may be more out there that hasn't been discovered. And so why am I saying this is a different approach? Um, you probably have heard about the reading wars. They've been going on literally more than 200 years. And the main combatants have been sort of a whole word approach versus a so-called phonics approach. And the research has always been very clear for quite a long time anyway, that phonics is superior, right? And so we, we, cause I've been on that phonics end of the continuum for quite some time, we felt like we're kind of battling it out against whole word. And I think that in this kind of black or white us or them mentality, some of the things that we've learned from contemporary research have not really um, marinated yet fully into the phonics of programs. A lot of what we're doing in mainstream phonics programs reflects things that predate the huge amount of research that we've had in the last 50 years, particularly the, maybe uh, I'll go with phonological revolution, like when we discovered in the 60s and 70s and 80s that um, written language was so dependent on speech and phonemic awareness was so pivotal for learning how to read. We were not necessarily completely changing our paradigm in general. So I think that this is part of the reason that some of the baggage that's, that's maybe from the thirties or forties is still with us. And Dr. Kilpatrick uh, is saying something pretty similar early on in his book, his essentials book, he said, the three classic approaches, whole word, phonics, and whole language, all originated long before there was any, or probably very little scientific research on reading development and reading difficulties. Now I would kind of group whole language and whole word together. Obviously they're very different in some ways, but in terms of how you attack a unfamiliar word, a lot of it went back to, it's just one big thing. You look at the whole thing, right? One, the whole word, but either way, um, there, he's saying our current approaches to teaching reading represent a repackaging of assumptions and methodologies from these three classic approaches. Yet we have extensive data that could be used as the basis for our educational practices. So maybe there is some baggage that we're carrying from before we've had so tremendous amount of research. So we all have been, if you're new to the science of reading or if you are, um, you know, you've been studying the research for decades, you, you've probably still heard, maybe more than you care to hear, <laughs> systematic explicit phonics instruction is more effective. And it's so true. I'm not arguing with that in any way here tonight. But what does that actually tell you about what to do tomorrow with your second grade struggling readers or your 15 year old dyslexic child? Um, we know so much from reading research about how the brain learns to read, 
but how to teach it has been less clear cut. And even if we, even if we gain a ton of information from research um, on specifically reading instruction as opposed to reading development, I think it will always be that it'll always be complex and messy because people are not robots, right? And we are, we need to fold in where our students are in their development and their motivation and um, their levels of decoding and their levels of comprehension, their vocabulary knowledge, all sorts of variables that make decision-making kind of tricky. So we don't have it all pinned down in other words, even though yes, we know that systematic phonics instruction is important. There's still a lot for us to learn. So here's where I would like to talk head um, today. What I want to talk about. Uh, our, why am I even claiming that this is a unique approach or a distinct approach? That's the first topic. I've alluded to some of that, but not a lot. And then I'm going to try to show four or five principles about these speech to print or speak, spell, read approaches that they have in common. Then we'll look at some historical roots, which might be interesting. Again, that's these are just what I'm speculating, and I'd love feedback. And then hopefully we'll have time for discussion. So why am I claiming that this speech to print or speak, uh, speech read, speak, spell, read approach is unique? Well, there are two things that occur to me that I'd like to spend a little time on that makes it worth putting some energy into. First of all, there are a cluster of these um, linguistic phonics approaches that distinguish themselves from traditional phonics. They're often right, including, you know, the program that I've developed, uh, Reading Simplified. These programs are often talking about how they do things a little different from the mainstream. And, and they have some commonalities, which we're going to discuss. So what, what makes this distinct? And that I think will be what the main discussion will be today. So I want to, soon I'll get to this, like, here are all these groups that I'm talking about. What are these? What's this cluster? And I'm going to show you this family tree that I made. I mean, we can discuss how much is accurate, but it's got things like Ebley and phonographics and read, write, and type and Montessori and spellings. And um, so we'll get to that. So that's number one, that there's this group of approaches and they seem to have something that's dis distinct from traditional phonics, particularly a lot of our commercial programs. And then the other reason I think this is worth discussing is that there is some evidence. It's not slam dunk evidence by any means. And they're not really clear cut experiments, which is usually our gold standard, but there is some evidence that these approaches get faster and more comprehensive outcomes. So we'll talk a little bit about that. It's just, um, some of it is just a logic and not necessarily, like I said, really strong science yet, but I think it's interesting. And I think, and. David Kilpatrick did such a great job in his Essentials book about pointing out, hey, we know so much, we're not doing what we know. And I thought this was really interesting at the back of his book. He analyzed um, all or many research interventions that have been studied as experiments and said, with, and put, them, put them in groups. Some got minimal or modest results, some got highly successful results. So, and I obviously his position is why aren't we doing what's in the highly successful category right so we've got this category on on the right that gets 12 to 25 standard score point gains that's significantly better than the zero to six standard score point gains right and um many many programs that are mainstream all over the u.s and abroad are in that blue category the minimal results category so then he went in to say, what is it that's dis distinct about these highly successful results? And he found these four programs that were in that one category. So just four programs that had some research behind them, experimental research at the time. Uh, he noted it was Linda Mood phoneme sequ sequencing program or LIPS, phonographics, discover reading, which was actually a combination of Linda Mood and phonographics, and then read, write, and type. So those are the ones that got the large standard score jumps. Then he wrote that um, these had these taught phonological decoding and connected text, and that they all had in common phonemic manipulation activities, such as deletion, substitution, and occasionally reversal. And those are definitely true of three of them, but actually it wasn't quite true of read, write, and type, which is I think is interesting because we've had, if you're following some of the 
the debate lately, there's been discussion about what is, how much evidence do we have about advanced phonemic awareness and the, the things that have to have that deletion. So but even though this may or may not be the salient element, although I do think it results, or research will show more and more that it's important. Uh, what was interesting is that all four of these approaches do have this speech to print approach or a speak, spell, read approach. They all start with um, the, the sounds that the kids know already and they work with those sounds and, and connect them to print. So I, that's just one piece of evidence that should cause us to, to consider what's going on here. <laughs> it's again, this is not a scientifically, um, it's not one is not compared against the other. So it's not the same thing as a strong experimental argument, but there's some evidence here that something is potentially more powerful with these approaches. It's not that the others weren't, weren't effective because they did get um, statistically effective significant results. They just got small results. And then there's some um, brain scans that, and some experiments with a couple of these programs that are also interesting. This one is from um, CMOS and his colleagues in 2002. And I think the title of this article says it all. Dyslexia specific brain activation profile becomes normal following successful remedial training. That's what we want for our kids, right? Who are not reading, who are dyslexic. We want for that. We want them to have um, brain patterns that are like a typically developing child, and they'll be much more likely to read well. And what they did was they uh, a small number of them used lips, and then most of those children were were given the phonographics. I don't know why they did two different interventions. They weren't really trying to say. They weren't trying to do an experiment, this intervention versus this intervention. They were just trying to say, can intervention change the brain? And if you see um, this picture from the study, the third column is the left side of the brain after the intervention. The first column is the left side of the brain before. And we know that to become a good reader, a lot of neural networks have to be built up over here on the left side. And that's a actual visual description of it. And the other interesting thing was this all happened in two months. It was intensive. I think it was 80 hours, but they did it fast. Those kids learned uh, crack the code in a short period of time. And here's another one. The same research group. Um, and they did, there's a brain scan that goes along with the same profile, same cluster of kids, but then you can see here is a different type of study. And they, they did one month of phonographics, which is one of our speak, spell, read um, approaches. And then they did one month of read naturally, which is a fluency building. And after the phonographics intervention, that's like, at, you can see the they're, they're, they did that after the first month and they kept testing after the second month to see how things improved. But Phonographics itself got large effects on pseudo word decoding or nonsense word decoding, real word decoding, and also pseudo word fluency skills and moderate effects on comprehension. So that's impressive. And then another program was um, put to the test with an experiment. This is the targeted reading intervention. And I actually led the development of that um, in starting in 2005. And the first study that we came out with in, a, in an experiment where we we're working with kindergarten and first grade struggling readers in low income rural communities, every reading measure that we tested, they had gains, effect sizes of 0.4 to 0.7 pretty, pretty excited because these were classroom teachers. It wasn't the, you know, a grad student who had nothing else to do. Well, very, had more focus <laughs> and able just to do nothing but the intervention. These were busy um, teachers and um, they, they got some results and the, that intervention has continued to get um, consistent results um, with word reading. Usually it's on the what works clearinghouse and many different nonprofits have recognized it. So we have the evidence of lips and phonographics and targeted reading intervention. Those all have some very similar roots, which we're going to talk about soon, and they have some similar principles and they get strong results. So that's one reason why we should maybe consider what's going on here. So let's see, Donna, are there any questions about that 
section before I go on to like, what do these programs have in common? Should I just keep going ahead? Oh, I'm sorry, I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone at, someone who's a, an OT said she would like the word write instead of spell because she wants to see the handwriting connection, the neural pathways being linked with handwriting. And, and, and we have talked about that too. So yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really wise, and that's going to briefly get mentioned that that certainly is important. You're right. So, but you can keep going. We're good. Okay. So, um, so first off, I think that these these approaches might be significantly different in the in their outcomes. It's still just very tentative. I just put some circumstantial evidence up. Um, and now I want to talk about what they have in common. And again, this is my perspective. And I, I'm probably leaving some things out. And I am probably <laughs> saying that somebody does A and they might not fully do it. So, but I think most of the programs that we've selected, and I'll, which I'll show you, do hit these principles. So I'm going to talk about, I think, four or five principles. Okay. <laughs> the first one is that most of the, these uh, speak, spell, read programs begin or emphasize the alphabetic principle more than they emphasize the alphabet or lots of information in isolation. And if you're not familiar with that concept, the alphabetic principle is the concept that our written language is a code for sounds. And so the, the um, graphemes on the left, like R and EA, they directly relate to phonemes R or E. All of these things match up so that Graphemes and phonemes are linked in the child's brain, and that's how they crack the code, our written code. They get this aha that the alphabetic principle of the alphabetic principle. It's not natural at all for kids to pick this up. They have to be, they have to have it revealed to them, uh, usually explicitly with instruction. Mm -hmm. And researchers make a big deal about the alphabetic principle. If you follow the research on reading development. Um, word reading acquisition, you'll see a lot of coverage for the alphabetic principle. And a really influential paper that Castles, Russell, and Nation wrote in 2018, Ending the Reading Wars, had this as one of their major sections. They're coming up, they were going to explain why cracking the alphabetic code is so central to learning to read in alphabetic writing systems such as English, and why it forms the foundation of all, for all that comes later. I don't think many people in the science of reading movement are going to disagree with that claim. I just think the way that the programs are organized <clears throat> hides the alphabetic principle for a little while. Doesn't make it clear. It's going to be a long time studying the alphabet instead of revealing how the code works. So with these so-called speak, spell, read methods, we are more likely to begin or Quick, very quickly move into the alphabetic principle by drawing the child's attention to the sounds and words that he already hears and connecting those to graph, uh, those phonemes to specific graphemes. That is what one thing that we're thinking is a early um, feature of these approaches. Now, here's an example of a program that doesn't get into actually decoding or encoding at all until after the 12th week of school. So the first 12 weeks there at the top, that's going to be focused on letters and letter names, um, maybe some letter sounds, phonemic awareness and isolation, but it's taking a long time to get to the alphabetic principle. It's not gonna reveal it straight away. And I think that Duke, Nell Duke and Heidi Ann Mesmer have an interesting thought about what could be going on with these types of programs where, they're teaching letters, maybe letter names, letter sounds, uh, maybe separately phonemic awareness. They're saying, imagine going to work for a shipbuilding company. You go to work the first day and are schooled in all the different types of bolts, screw, screws, and nails. You learn their names, the different sizes and the different types, but you never learn that their purpose is to join pieces of metal and that those pieces of metal are used to build ships. 
Although this situation is clearly ridiculous, it is actually analogous to what we see in some pre-kindergarten and kindergarten classrooms. Children are being taught to name letters or even identify the sounds that, they, that the letters represent, but they are unclear about why they are learning it. Letter sound knowledge, if it's even being taught, that's my, that's my little addition, is being learned in a vacuum. The children has no context for how to use the information or no big picture. And I think when we get more rapidly down to the alphabetic principle, we're going to um, not have this problem where, where kids, who, particularly those who've had limited literacy experience, they're going to be more clear on what is it you're talking about? Okay, I can see that squiggle and I can say, but why am I saying, <laughs> what does this have to do with telling these cool stories that I want someone to read to me? Okay, so how about uh, a video example? If everything works, I would like to show you a video example of a three-year-old um, cracking the code or the, in the first day of cracking the code. So I try to find kids who are really beginners so you can see the power of revealing the alphabetic principle. So it's gonna be a video of a three-year-old who doesn't know all his letter sounds, Today, in this video, the day I did this for about 10 minutes, he didn't know how to segment phonemes other than maybe the first one. And he probably didn't know the alphabetic principle at all. So all of that I'm trying to show him just to make clear how the alphabetic principle works in this one activity. And I'm coming at it from a speech to print, sounds to print approach. What do you hear in this word map? And then, then we'll get into print. So please let me know if you can hear this. I'm not started it yet though, so. <laughs> okay, can you hear really it? Good words, thank yes. you so much. Maybe you will make one or two more words, okay? okay? Thank you. Okay, so this word is going to be map. I need to use the map to find out where to go. Can you say the word map? Map. Map. Let's stretch out the word map. Map. You try it. Map. map. Nice. Do it again. Map. Nice. Okay. What was the first sound that you heard when I said, mm? oh, you're shaking the table. Yeah. Can you sit up a little bit? Thank you. Can you scoot up so I can see your face? The camera can see your face? Okay. What's the first thing that comes out of my mouth when I say, and you say, mm, map? Map. Yes, that's the whole word, but just what's at the beginning, right here, when I say, mm, map? Mm. Mm, which one of these is, mm? You got it, now say, mm. mm. Very nice. Now listen to the next sound. What do we hear next? Mm. Map. Mm. Mm. This is the beginning. Ah. ah, that is great. Which one is ah? That's pa. That's ah. Say ah. Ah. So look, you've already got mm, ah. That's the beginning of the word map. Mm. Remember, we're building the word map, right? Pa. Well, not pa, but map. Can you say map again? Map. Okay, look what you've got. You've got map. We need the last sound. Ah. That's ah. You got it right here. Ah. You got it. Look at it. This is ah. You got it. What's the last sound? That is right. Pa. Is this pa? It is. Pa. Nicely done. Okay, check the sounds. Ah. Well, remember, we're building the word map. Mm -hmm. ah. That's great. You made the word map. Awesome. You've made the word mom and map and mop and one other word. Let's see. <laughs> so that's just an example to show how an emphasis on the alphabetic principle might get kids more quickly into the code. We're listening to, we're drawing on what he hears and showing him how he can connect it to print. And I, that was just like mid, mid to late way through a 10 minute episode. It was his first exposure to reading 
it, with me anyway. And like I said, at the beginning, he couldn't segment and he didn't know many letter sounds, but so much unlocked in just a very short period of time. He, he's a smart cookie, so it won't always unlock that quickly for a kid that young. I realize he's young, but it's not actually atypical either when um, you reveal, when you make things kind of connected that way. Yeah, <laughs> Diane says she's got several that have no pre-literacy skills, right? It's, it's gonna be very common. Can you see my slides again? Yes. Thank you, Donna. Um, okay, so that was principle number one. Let's all begin at the alphabetic principle. A lot of these programs are gonna do that maybe from the beginning, like we do at Read Simplified, or at least pretty quickly. Another principle that um, gave this term the, its name, speech to print, is organizing the code by phonology or organizing the code, the written language by the sounds of the language. So here we have the O sound and we're presenting the O sound to the child and organizing it by spelling. So we're, again, using what they know, the sounds and organizing information that way. And this is Dr. Louisa Motz's very famous quote. She says, one of the most fundamental flaws found in almost all phonics programs including traditional ones, is that they teach the code backwards. That is, they go from letter to sound instead of from sound to letter. The print to sound or conventional phonics approach leaves gaps, invites confusion, and creates an efficiency. Why is that? I think it's because we are orienting the written code, all of our complex spelling system. We're organizing it by spelling, which is an adult lens. Okay, the adult who's a mature reader sees the code this way and then can make sense of it. But what does the child understand? The child is already coming to us with a pretty sophisticated understanding of language. They may know 5,000 words, they know, may know 10,000 words, and they know the meanings of those words and they know the sounds in those words. They may not have refined phonemic awareness, but if they, if you tell them, um, sit or pit, they can certainly hear the difference. They know those are different words. So they've got a lot of information already cooking up there in their brains. So a lot of these speech to print, speak, spell, read approaches, they're more likely to organize the code by sound. There you've got the O sound and various O spellings. Another week, another Another month, you might teach the E sound and its various spellings. Some of these programs teach these spellings um, all at once. Some of them kind of fold them in gradually, but they build to this concept of let's learn these sounds. A lot, when I look at other programs that are trying to be very explicit with the code, and that is good, they're, again, they're organized um, by uh, an adult's lens, and they're, they're hard to wrap your head around as a beginner. And there's just so many of them. I got tired of typing, so I just put et cetera, because what is the, where, what is the organization? There, it's a list of things, but is there a logic behind it other than going from simple to complex? It's kind of, could the beginning blends be further down? Could the floss rule be further up there? Yes, they certainly could because the, the organization is not based on sounds, but it's just based on spelling patterns. Marnie, there's some people are seeing a black line at the top and the bottom. I am too, but it doesn't seem to be interfering. Thank uh, you. I don't know. Does that make anything? I moved some stuff. Does that help at all? Uh, no, now it's on the side, on the right side. Okay. How do I get rid of, is that better? Uh, that's a little better. Yeah, there's a little... Uh, it's a little, now, now it's too big for the screen. Okay. Where is the black now? The black's gone, but okay, okay. you're good now. You're good. Okay, great. Thanks for the feedback. Sure. So this idea of organizing by sound and organizing by the child, what the child's bringing to the equation, um, a lot of it comes from the insights of the connectionist model of how to learn to read and also the this triangle framework. Mark Seidenberg has really done a lot to popularize this. You can find this in the language at the speed of sight, his book. But 
Um, we know that kids, to be able to learn to read, to get to that outcome over there, to be able to read the squiggles in cat, they have to build up this neural network um, connecting meaning and phonology or sounds at, with the spelling or the orthography. All of those things are linked in multiple ways, lots of neural um, connections going back and forth between all of these things to give you the quick access to this information later when you need to read it or, or hear the term. And um, all of this information is kind of drawn back up to the surface. So you're connecting meaning, phonology, and spelling. So what um, the kids already bring right there, they come to us with this meaning and phonology network. So just imagine that we've got meaning here with yellow and phonology um, with gray. This is the network that they've built up with, um, for, with their five or six years of life or four because they've been listening and talking and it's very sophisticated actually. So we should draw from what they have and then just show them how they could connect it to spelling so we can bond it like this. And I think a lot of a lot of people are talking about this model, but it's just that the orientation of many decoding programs, um, they start over here with spelling or orthography as the orientation, instead of thinking, what is the child already coming to us with? They already know these words. Let's build on what they know and orient the information we're sharing with them by, by via analogy. So we're gonna move from phonology, which they already have, to bond onto that, the spelling, so that at connects with the letter C-A-T. So let me show you some examples of this, okay? This is from the uh, Reading Simplified. We would say teach the er sound for a week, and we would teach that sound and various spellings, even to an um, you know, some older students, this is actually fairly hard. This is probably from our fourth grade material. So kids who are reading at the fourth or fifth grade, but still need some decoding to be shored up. They, they would read the word artery and have to sort it and say the sounds as they do it. And then they would read the word generous, which also has the same ER. And then they might read the word circus, which is a different er spelling than the word furnace, which is different, et cetera. So again, it's oriented by the sounds that they already hear, er, and then we're just showing them how to organize that information. It, um, we find that kids learn this information a lot more rapidly when it's presented this way all at once. They can handle it. We've not had kids that get too confused by it. And uh, then they go and they read er sound text. So again, we're continuing on the same thread of when we're working on the beginning stages of decoding, we're going to practice um, a sound to print orientation. So this is say for the first grade reader or the late kindergarten reader, uh, we would read the er sound here and notice all the er sound words, multiple spellings. Mostly we've just got uh, I-R and E-R. I think there's the E-A-R in herd. So there's the repetition. Um, and that's one of the reasons that they're able to learn that information. They've been reading these words, writing them as they say the sound, artery, and then they go and read a text. Of course, the kids who got this passage would read something harder than this, but this is just an example to show you, regardless of where the kids are and their, um, their word identification knowledge, you can still have this approach. And so some other folks are doing something similar, not just us here at Read Simplified. Like Phonic Books has a lot of books that focus on one sound, multiple spelling. So maybe you would do that sorted type activity and then send your kids off to read or maybe read with you this one. Notice the errs and perfect and pearl and curt and surfing. And here is Nora from uh, Ebley. She's teaching the same thing. Err and look there's more than one spelling and she's going to go on to teach some other spellings as well. There's more than just three. Uh, here is the Literacy Hill which was for the program formerly known as Tiny Steps Make Big Strides. They have a fun game called Discard, which is like Uno. And notice these are the er sound words. It's focus from the present, the orientation again of the child. I can hear the sounds er, and I'm organizing them in a way that makes sense to the, me as a child. So that was number two. Let's check to see if there's anything that I'm missing. So we've gotten, the, one of the things that these 
approach the seven common, they, they lead or they get quickly into the alphabetic principle. They're more likely to organize things by uh, the print, the code by sound. Another principle, which is kind of folded in, actually, you know what, before we get into number three, I forgot I have another video. I think we should see a video. Who wants to see a video? Everybody likes to watch videos. Is that okay? Um, videos are great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what I want to show you is a video from um, Jennifer Glick's class. She is, this I think was a first grade classroom and she's doing that sorted activity I just showed you, but with easier words and they're doing the I sound and she's made this a group activity. So everybody in her class is actually doing the same thing at the same time. So it's I sound and they're sorting. And as they sort, she's trying to get them to say the sounds. Now this is early and she's having, um, she's having a challenge getting them to actually say the sounds, but that's her intention. And it really helps make these connections, which is what the next point is going to be. All right, so let me know if you can hear the I sound sort, team sorted is what this is called. And where does it go? I should hear you saying the sounds as you write them. I want to hear you say those sounds as you write them, remember? Miliano, is it your turn? Read a word. So what, what does it say? Hi. Hi. Is he right? Yeah. And where are you going to write it, Emiliano? Here. Oh, he's putting it in the IGH. Is that the right spot? Yeah. I can't hear you say those sounds. I can't see. Listen to your sounds. Hi. Hi. Say the sounds as you go. Now it's Rahaf's turn. Let's hear Rahaf's three to word. Pick any word you want. Is she right? You gotta tell her that, guys. Nice. Now, Rahaf, where are we gonna write it? Where does it go? How is the I sound spelled? Is she right? Yeah. Say the sounds as you write it. Yeah. Up, guys. So can you imagine how that is going to maybe make more sense to the child and how getting into our next point is that that's going to tie into their, um, they're reading the words and they're saying the words that's going to get into our next point. So that's an example of organizing the code by sound or phonology. And the other thing that was happening there was that they weren't just reading, they were also connecting that with sounds. They were saying the sounds as they wrote them. So these um, speak, spell, read approaches are more likely to integrate semantics, phonology, orthography, and also the sensory motor act of writing. This kind of, a, this is gonna lead more naturally, I think, to this connectionist model of how the brain learns to read. We know that reading and spelling bidirectionally influence one another. It's not going to be a one-to-one -one relationship. You know, we're all going to be most likely better readers than we all are, will be at, spell, be at spelling, but they definitely impact one another. And the importance of making these connections between reading subskills was just recently emphasized by the International Dyslexia Association. This is just a snippet of their new fact sheet on phonemic awareness. I encourage you to check it out if you haven't seen it yet. I think it just came out in June. They have several hallmarks of a strong phoneme awareness program, but just to be brief, I've listed the top three. They say it's important to have a focus on phonemic awareness rather than phonological sensitivity from the beginning. In other words, getting straight into the phoneme, not the more global level of the syllable, the word, or the rhyme. 
and that's what's meant by phonological sensitivity, and also systematically linking phoneme awareness instruction to grapheme and letter knowledge from the beginning and throughout later manipulation activities. So you could see that in the earlier activity that instituted the that was an example of the alphabetic principle, and then also the most recent video of the sorted. And then Again, they're just kind of reiterating the point that we're making here to integrate practice of phonemic awareness or phoneme awareness, letter and graphing knowledge and handwriting. The more we can connect those, the easier it will be for the brain to build up this, these networks. And you can also see uh, Dr. Susan Brady's lit review from 2020 in the Reading League Journal where she gets into this, um, this concept of integration between phonemic awareness and phonics. She was doing a review of what the National Reading Panel found and what's happened since then, 20 years later. And it'll be very, it'll be much in alignment with this IDA fact sheet. Here's an example from uh, the program Phonographics. They're gonna have the kids read a word and they're gonna be working at the phoneme level. Notice like with glass, it's kind of set aside. It's one, the, the, the SS is set aside. It's one grapheme, one phoneme. They're not going to cluster, say, GL together or FR together. <clears throat> and um, in phonographics, these kids would blend the word flag to read it. And then they would write the word and say the sounds. G, just as we did in the sorted activity above. Those kids were, at least Jennifer was trying to get the kids to say the sounds. T -t -r -i, try. And this integration is becoming more and more popular. And I think that's exciting. And this is one of the things we can learn from this, these types of approaches. But there are some programs that, that are very far from that. So for instance, here in kindergarten with this program, the kids are not going to be doing the phoneme level until week five. So they'll spend an entire month at that phonological sensitivity level, which has um, can at, is helpful. It's just not as helpful as getting straight to the phoneme which is what that IDA fact sheet said. And then it's not until week seven that they're going to start to blend sounds. And it's not until week 20, 35 that they're gonna put all those letter sounds and the phonemic awareness work that they've been doing together to be able to decode words. So I think this is probably more extreme that, that many programs are not gonna be that long so we get to decoding, but this is an example where of really isolating everything and expecting some sort of mastery or excellence in phonemic awareness and isolation and letter sound knowledge and isolation before kids are ready to handle decoding. But I think that I'm hoping that that example of the three-year-old can reveal how it not necessarily as complicated as we think. So let's see what my example. So let me show you a really short example for this concept of integration. Remember, we're saying that these programs are maybe more likely to integrate that, that triangle network and do it while they're writing. So they're using the benefits of handwriting at multiple levels. So let me show you a super uh, short video of an activity we call Read It. It's kind of like that activity that we showed the, the worksheet of, of from phonographics. Kids read a word, then they write and they say the word, and they say the sounds. And then also um, we have them erase the sounds as they say the sounds. So there's a lot of building up of this network of sounds, meaning, and graphemes. Or, or um, orthography. So here is a super fast example of connecting and integrating, decoding and encoding sounds and symbols and meanings all together. And keep watch quickly because it's going to go back fast. <laughs> Can you hear it? Okay. Let's put these sounds together. Okay. What are the first two sounds? Um, put them together. Uh, put all three together. Yeah. Uh, 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 nice. 
Nice. Okay, great job. You put the sounds together. Now say each sound. Beauty. Okay, let's erase and say the sound. Can I read through this one? Sure. <laughs> you want to fix your ah? Nice, much sharper. Okay, now erase and say the sounds. All right, I was trying to write a note. Uh, Svetlana brought up uh, integrative speech to print. Yeah, we talked about the word integrated or integrative, uh, linguist, in, linguistically, uh, integrated, linguistically aligned phonics. <laughs> There's so many names, it's tricky. Hopefully we'll have some time for that. Okay, so. That was the third point, just like integrate everything. It doesn't have to be isolated. And if you already have a program that, you know, you're not free to switch over to one of these programs that we're gonna share about, perhaps you can still just um, do some tweaks to your activities so that you are integrating these things more, more quickly. And uh, a fourth major point, is kind of big and depending on your you know how much you've been following the science of reading and how much you read deeply about some of the theories undergirding it this may or may not make much sense so i'm going to go through it i'm not going to be able to do justice to it but uh if this piques your interest you can pursue these ideas further later potentially so we're learning that reading is really much more based on statistical learning than rules we're learning that kids teach themselves quite a lot after getting uh, explicit instruction to get started. We're learning that, uh, that another decoding skill that kids need is set for variability and that when we mix things up, information up, interleaving them, they're more likely going to learn. So all of this leads children to have cognitive flexibility, which is one of the things that we're going to talk about. So let's first talk about the, the statistical learning. This comes from a new addition to um, actually the aptly named the science of reading. <laughs> so um, Dr. Seidenberg and um, Seidenberg, Ferry Thorne and Zevin just recently wrote this. The intuition that reading English requires learning pronunciation rules and memorizing irregular words is a premise of phonics instruction that dates back from the 19th century. And the rules and exceptions approach retains its intuitive appeal. However, there is little agreement among researchers or educational practitioners about either part. On the rule side, there are widely varying proposals about what the rules are and how they should be taught. Just as an aside, how many of you have seen rules, you know, rule list uh, A over here with this program and rule list B over here with this program and they don't agree? It's very hard to pin these things down because our language is not that clear cut, which I'll explain more in a minute. They go on to write, on the lexical side, reading curricula disagree about which words have irregular pronunciations. Many hold that higher frequency words need to be memorized, not simply exceptions, but differing, but different regarding the number of words involved. In our view, the lack of convergence on these issues arises from the mistaken assumption that the system consists of rules with exceptions. And instead of that, thinking about how our code works and how we learn to read, uh, what is the dominant theory right now is that we learn to read and learn phonics, spellings, and patterns through statistical learning. We learn mostly subconsciously by detecting these patterns. Our brain detects patterns that we are not even aware of. We can certainly be explicitly taught some of it, but we don't explicitly learn all of it through um, instruction. The brain is amazing at what it will pick up. And so in that same uh, chapter, Dr. Seidenberg and colleagues write that, you know, there's one way of thinking about how our code works. And that is that our spelling system is categorical. It's either in or out, it's either regular spelling or it's irregular. It's everything is in one category or the other. So that's what's meant by categorical. And don't you think that most phonics programs teach this type of thinking? In contrast, what the research is saying about not only how we learn, but also about how our language, our written language actually acts, it actually is more of a continuum. So 
some words are nice and easy, like got. That has so, a so-called regular spelling. And of course, we know the word one or yacht is an oddball. It's strange. It doesn't fit the patterns that we would expect, although still there's some reliability there. But there are things in the middle, and we could argue about, well, is like is said an exception because frankly, AI is in mountain and fountain and probably some other words, but then it's not really in a CVC sound word. So where does it fall? And have it's maybe someone consider it regular because BE is very common to be at the end of words like give. So there it's a debate because it's that's not actually how the brain is processing it. It's processing it as um, possibly A, possibly B, possibly C. It's just not an either or. It's not categorical. <clears throat> so when we try to teach kids um, the rules that are going to put it in one of these categories, we may be going against the way the brain naturally works. So that's the statistical theory, statistical learning idea that I think undergirds a lot of these speech to print approaches. Another one is share self-teaching theory, which has a lot of studies behind it. And he says that um, after children have a sufficient amount of phonemic awareness, phonics knowledge, and basic decoding strategies, then they teach themselves a lot of the code. So this is actually how the curve looks for them learning words. There's 20,000, 40,000 words that a typically a, a good reader at, at, knows at the end of 12th grade. They couldn't have possibly have been explicitly taught all of those words. How do you learn a word day to day? How do you learn words right now? Um, a lot, you're teaching yourself a lot of that. So we have to get the, the momentum started through explicit instruction for sure. And we have to draw to children's phonemic awareness out so they can connect to print. And we have to show them how some of the code works, but a lot of it happens through them working out the code on their own. Um, another research concept is this newer term. There's not a lot of written about it. It's called set for variability. It's not a very um, catchy term, but basically it means when a child tries to read one word and they read it incorrectly, can they move from that incorrect pronunciation to the correct one? Do they have a set of vocabulary skills and phonological processing skills that allows them to adjust for the variability that could happen? And one um, example that's commonly used in these recent research paper is the word wasp, okay? So you might read it as wasp right there on the left. And then uh, say the child reads it as wasp. Does the child have the ability to realize, oh, it's probably not a word, what could it be? Oh, maybe wasp. That is a decoding skill that is really important. Um, it's not taught very in many programs, but we're finding out from research that it is the, probably the a second important decoding strategy after blending. And the other good news is that you can explicitly teach it. There's been at least, I think, two experiments where they tried to teach kids this skill and they got better at the skill and they got better at their reading. So this is another theory that undergirds the speech to print, uh, speak, spell, read, thinking. And all of this together leads me to, to kind of suggest that there's cognitive flexibility that's really important for developing a good reader. And we can organize our instruction in a way that leads kids to have this skill or maybe make it harder for them. So for instance, here at Reading Simplified, this is our streamlined pathway. This is just a one page scope and sequence. You can see, I, I can't explain all of it, but basically the colors are 12 levels of different vowel sounds that we focus on. So level two is the O sound and like the O and go and boat and show and so forth. Once kids get to around the fifth, the sixth, or the seventh step, they've acquired a lot of advanced phonics knowledge. They've learned a lot of long vowels and various spellings. And then we can start to not just give them decodable text, but we can give them a transitional text, say like Messy Bessie or Henry and Mudge or Little Bear or Frog and Toad. We can get there earlier because of some of the things that we've set the child up for. And when we, what are the, what's the advantage of getting there earlier? Well, then they can be more equipped to learn 
what the patterns actually are in our language. When we close kids off from the um, how the real the real world works and for in terms of written text for too long, they don't have enough exposure to the patterns, the variability. So decodable texts are super important, but if we continue it for too long, they might not have the flexibility that uh, is required to do set for variability, to play around with the sounds and words. So, but when we get here, this child, theoretically, maybe they haven't seen the word villains yet and evil and superhero, but they can work through it with the teacher's help. And that will give them this, um, the confidence, first of all, but also it'll improve their word attack abilities because they have greater cognitive flexibility. Here's another example. So this is a really simplified text. It's pretty hard though, because it's the O sound with some simple one syllable words like Joe and old and boat and coast. And, um, but there's some hard words in there like alone and floating and sunset and bubbling. Those are multi-syllable words. The child may or may not be ha have gotten explicitly taught how to handle them yet, but they can be coached through them in the context of the text. So this is an example of you can give them the feedback, teacher feedback when they get to floating and maybe you just cover up the ing so they can read the word float and then you reveal the ing so then they can figure out it in goes at, back to back with it and they can decode the multi-syllable word or maybe they're frustrated and you give it to them. But some of the time they're going to learn some strategies that um, they, they're gonna learn some information about how the code works and the pattern recognition because they've been exposed exposed to things earlier than maybe other programs. Also, this kind of brings into the question of the text type. So it's, we're still in this example, we're still focusing, focusing on decoding and learning the O sound. That's still the main point, but it's not so tightly controlled that all the words are what the child has been, co has covered up to that point. So, let me show some examples of how this works, particularly set for variability, because I think this is a really big deal. When a child reads a word and they and it's not something that they've been taught before, especially in a lot of programs were said, well, we shouldn't be giving them that. They need to be taught everything beforehand. Otherwise, they're going to be frustrated. And certainly we're going to be, you know, alert for their level of frustration. But there's also some level of frustration that is appropriate and needed. And so each child's needs are going to be different, but we shouldn't be so phobic of exposing them to patterns in our written language um, that are typical, even if they're tricky. So here's an example of a first grader. It's super short as well. She's going to try to read the word guess. And I don't even think, I don't remember if I even coach her on it. I think she does everything for herself. And this is an example of her putting into practice the set for variability because when, what does she do probably when she comes across the word guess for the first time? She's not been taught explicitly G-U, it can be G at the beginning of words. So she's gonna say G, A, uh, S. So check out how, how she does set for variability. <clears throat> we call it the flex it strategy. No, no. You, you cannot look. Uh, uh -huh. Guess, guess. Nice figuring out there. Guess, guess. That was so fast. I couldn't hear it. Can you guys, could you hear it? Yes, we could hear it. I can't hear you, Donna. <laughs> uh, I'm not. Maybe I'm, I only have one headphone. Did you guys hear? Did you see what she did? Or should I do it? Yes. You did. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Don. Okay. Um, so I, I think that's pretty slick. Um, and let me show it to you with an older kid. And he's going to read the word patriot. And what I think is really cool is that he doesn't even know the word patriot, but he still figures it out. So it's in his, he's heard it at some, you know, deep level, or maybe it, he make, it makes sense to say it that way, but he, he still doesn't even know the meaning, but he still figures out the word. And I think I probably give him more help with this. Okay, so this one is multi-syllable flex it. This is a, a AKA set for variability with the word patriot. King, King George sent in soldiers, red coast crowd, red coast guards, 
What's, this is a word you may not know. Red coats. Nice. Red coats crowded the streets. Okay, what do you think based on the picture the red coats are? They're, like their suits, mm -hmm. kind of. And whose um, soldier uniforms are these? Uh, British. Yes, that's right. British. Mm-hmm. <laughs> crowded the streets. Alex became, became in the... Alex became... A parrot? A p at patria? Mm-hmm. Patriot oat. Good try. Patriot? Nice fixing. I like how you did that. He, he became a patriot. What does that mean? I don't know. It's someone who's um so <laughs> did you catch that? We talked obviously about the meaning, but he was way off, but he looked more carefully, got a little bit of direction from the teacher, and then he figured it out. And that was set for variability in action. Here's a question that's interesting. How is this different from three queuing? Well, did you notice? Okay. Um, thank you, Donna. There is um, a, a great amount of attention that the teacher's giving the the child to focus on the print. So three cueing emphasizes um, looking at the picture or making a guess based on the context of the sentence. This is using the print and playing around with sounds and words to make meaning. So we're not against using context. We really need to use context. It's just that we are against using it as the primary approach to attacking an unfamiliar word. So both of these kids used the print as their primary approach and context was supportive. But obviously the boy who didn't even know the word patriot, he couldn't have been using context to figure out patriot. He was really struggling with print, working out the kinks of seeing all those letters left to right. He, I mean, that's why he, at first he added, added an R because he, he just didn't see and process that information well. And so I think he said part, you know, because he probably was thinking about the word part. And so he had to pay better attention. So drawing students attention to the print and trying to get, get them to connect it with sounds and use their meaning making brain is what we want. That is what the triangle framework model tells us to do. It doesn't tell us to disassociate from meaning. It says, put the whole package together. And I think for the beginning reader, we know that, or the struggling reader that the primary um, method needs to be, let's look at those symbols and attack them left to right. So a teacher wants to know, I get it with teacher support, but what happens when they're not having direct teacher support? So it's fine to give an easier text when you don't have that option. Mm -hmm. But when you have that precious moment with a child, don't be afraid to challenge them. Well, that's the time to do it if you're with Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then a fifth concept here is I just, a lot of these speak, spell, read approaches um, tend to get, get to it faster. There's just uh, quicker access to decoding, uh, quicker um, acquisition of high frequency words, moving quickly into decodable, I mean, transitional text as we show. So this is like, I think the first week of school for these kids and they're already doing the O sound, even though they're struggling readers. Another program might have them working at the short vowel level for a long time. <laughs> Right. Here is an example from, again, Jennifer's classroom. This is in, when she moved to kindergarten and um, she had those kids doing on the third day an activity where they're playing around with sounds and words. Let's change fat to bat. And they went over to get, create the word tab to and at. And so that was a lot earlier because it was all integrated um, phonemes, graphemes. So to wrap up before we discuss, uh, I thought this might be interesting to dis just to kind of point out what are some of these programs and what are their historical roots. So again, I don't mean to claim that this is absolute or uh, final. This is just a draft for us to kind of to start kicking about some ideas. Um, but we developed this partial family tree of a speech to print approach or speak spell read approach. Because um, to, just to show where the intellectual and research roots of everything are. So if we dig down deep into the, the base, 
interestingly, Montessori was doing a uh, speech to print approach. She was getting children to pay attention to phonemes before the word phonemic awareness was uh, invented. So one of the first Montessori activities is um, in the language domain is I spy. So the teacher would say, I spy something with my little eye that, that starts with mm, and the teacher might have some objects out in front that includes some mm sound objects and some that aren't. And she's drawing their attention to sound and then she gets them to do uh, the movable alphabet activity where they're making words. And then um, what also came after that is one strand of Montessori through Muriel Dwyer was organizing the code by sound, this O sound and various spellings. Most Montessori's don't do that, but there is one strand that did that. And then on the other side uh, in the roots there, or the trunk of the tree are, is the um, speech and language community and the neuroscience community, the people that discovered that our, so much of our learning to read is built off phonology. That was radical in the 60s and 70s. And that, that just created a lot of change. And coming out of that was um, what Pat Lindemood did to create lips. There you can see that. And then if we go over to the right, that I think these programs have been influenced by um, you know, speech and language and neuroscience, like read, write, and type. Janine Heron had a neuroscience background. And uh, I think Spellphabet and Spell Links have that speech and language background. And that's why they are organizing the code by sound. Um, and then there was a really tremendous amount of things that happened because of the work of Diane McGinnis, who wrote Why Our Children Can't Read. And so that's kind of the left side of the tree. It's a big part of the tree. And look at all those programs that have come out of that orientation. She oriented the code in a different way and also was pulling from the information that we had before about um, phonology being so pivotal. And she influenced phonographics and phonographics has influenced all these other programs as far as I can tell. Sounds Right, Ebly, On Track Reading, Sound Reading, Phonic Books, the Targeted Reading Intervention, what I mentioned earlier. So that's just um, my, one view and I'd love to get some feedback um, so we can maybe keep making it more refined or accurate because uh, I, like I said, I'm not an expert on all of those programs, but I notice these commonalities. Many of the five principles I mentioned above are gonna be common to these programs. So what can you do next? Um, I suggest that you check out this book because it, everything in it is not 100% spot on, but uh, most of it is amazing what she's accomplished. She revealed so much about the research that came out of the 60s and 70s, and also so much about how our code is actually organized, which relates to a lot of what you saw previously. And then this is a new um, Facebook group where people are just kind of exploring this approach, speech to print, aka linguistic phonics. So you might want to go there, just uh, type in that title, speech to print linguistic phonics, to join that group if you want to learn more about these types of approaches. Also, I have a webinar, it's like a um, on-demand workshop where you can learn about the most uh, high leverage activities we do here at Reading Simplified, switch it, read it, and sort it. You saw two of those examples. So you would go to readingsimplified.com forward slash webinar to watch that. And if you want to dive deep, of course, we would welcome you into the Reading Simplified Academy. You can learn our version of this speak, spell, and read um, approach. So let me, here's that website or the Facebook group for those of you who are interested in that. And then I wanted to um, discuss, I'm sorry I went long, but I'd love to know what, what you guys think and where we can tweak things. And So if you want to say something, just unmute yourself and you can join in the conversation, please. Svetlana had a, an idea. She called it integrative, integrated, oh, what was it, Svetlana? Integrated sp speech to print. Speech to print? No, I think it was. Did you see that? I did. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Hi, um, I'm just wondering how I approach colleagues about this information. Okay. 
that's uh, they're not very inviting to the new information that's out there. Uh, it's kind of stuck on their ways. And I'm, I just want to go like full steam ahead, just like you're talking about, because I'm seeing um, in my classroom already in the two weeks I've been doing switch it and build it with um, like your, the free things that you have. Um, it's just been amazing. And I don't know how to talk, approach my colleagues. I'm kind of scared about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would be too. I, um, it's hard to persuade people and they have a different worldview. Right. So I would love to hear people in this in the chat. I know probably uh, most of you have been facing this, if not recently, at some point in your career. So I personally it's, it's all about what what are the, you know, your personality. But I would personally go more one on one to each person and see what do you think is most persuasive to them. And maybe they would like to be in a Facebook group. Or maybe they have a child that's struggling with the letter sounds and you want to show them a video of an activity like what we call switch it, where kids are connecting phonemes and graphemes and moving them around. Um, a lot of people recommend listening to Emily Hanford's amazing audio documentaries, which you can find at APM reports. Those are super powerful, but if people aren't going to be interested. That's what led me to you. What's that? That's what led me to you. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's... Um, I have on our science of reading what I should have learned in college. Um, no, our science of reading info page. We have a, a place for beginners and it's a welcome letter for, our, for the Facebook members, but it's just a place for beginners. And we have like the best of the best things there that you can watch. And maybe that'll help guide you. Cause if you're new to this, maybe you don't have the confidence yet that you know, this is all new to you, but you're seeing results and how do you get, share your excitement with others? Right. Um, and, you know, you could, you can go on a journey with these folks and, and, you know, make it a weekly thing that you gather and you have, you know, you know compare notes and see what, what, how you can improve your practice with each other. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so I my name is Susanna, and I had um I had a question. I typed it in the chat box twice about uh, secret stories. Which I'm sorry, is, I missed the question. Go ahead, Susanna. Uh, well, it's about secret stories, which is uh, do you know of her? Um, yeah, which is also a speech to print kind of approach mm -hmm. through like the emotional side of kids so I was just wondering your thoughts on on that in combination with what you have been talking about tonight yeah um I know there are our teachers um there's a lot of enthusiasm for it and I, I think that's really exciting uh, and I like how it's oriented towards the sounds right because that's one of the major principles right I didn't think about it for this tree per se because it's 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 about the letter sounds and not a program for teaching reading, but that's right. an interesting thing. Well, de I'll definitely have to, I know I need to get in more into this to be able to give a, a, a strong opinion, but anytime a program focuses on the sounds and at, at, at the phonemic level and teaches it fast and early, I, it's more well, that's likely what I was than thinking not. About. <clears throat> I remember her saying like, we introduced the A in kindergarten as ah, and then the first thing we do is point to the calendar and it's August. Right. <laughs> and yeah. so we need to just teach. So, and her approach is to teach it with a story because that's what kindergartners understand better. You know, they can relate to that more and remember it more. So it seems to me to fit in nicely with what you're talking about. So. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? I like what Dorothy says. I was going to recommend this to um, the earlier comment. Um, I think the most influence on my colleagues, I had the most influence on my colleagues by them seeing the results of my students. Yeah. I got them asking what I was doing and allowed me to share my techniques. Yeah. And I think personally, when they're asking, then like share one thing and don't say, oh, it's this program. Say, you know, I just try this different variation based on some things I've been learning. And because if you're tend to people, people tend to be suspicious if you're selling a program, the whole kit and caboodle, 
but maybe this is just an activity. That's like what here at Read and Simplify, we lead with switch it. It's a phonemic manipulation activity with the letter with the letter sounds on the board. We do that a lot. We we emphasize it a lot as a sort of like the gateway drug. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Are there any ideas on how to engage the um, homeschooling communities? Um, because a lot of them that, um, if you go on a lot of the forums and the Facebook pages, it's like, if you say anything that's not OG based, they will say, well, that's not for dyslexic kids or mm. you just get a huge amount of backlash from it. Yeah. It's powerful. Again, I, I, I probably personally, I just would uh, go based on the context, like what's my relationship in that community or, and how much can I, what leverage do I have? So it would vary quite a bit depending on what I sensed was the community's ethos. So if it was mostly, you know, one way or the highway, then I might say, yeah, I know that's widely thought of and this it's been surprising how X happened. <laughs> and Nora is very wise and always pointing out it's people want to hear the stories. So yeah, that I, I understand that, but my child did this and I know of this child that did that. And that also can be a little hook. It's not going to sell everybody, but it's probably the gentlest way. I, I think this is Sandra and I'm part of the homeschooling community and tutor kids in that community. Mm -hmm. And the biggest hook that many of us tutors and parents are throwing out there is the time difference. So in a speech dependent program, we're not talking five, six, seven, eight years in a program or three or four years before you get to like long vowel sounds. Yeah. Um, and so when parents it has to come from people who have experience. And I think just sharing our experience of, hey, look, in you know three or four sessions, I can get someone reading an authentic text um, is, is a huge difference than, the, than a more traditional way. And I think it's just by giving examples, we have a lot of people in the homeschooling community switching to speech to print programs. Mm -hmm. That is really well said. Thank you for having that, not only that experience, but bringing it to our attention. Yeah, I don't, I'm only tertiary in relationship to homeschooling. You're one of many communities I get connected to. So that's really great. You actually have that exact exa experience. Um, Hi, um, this is Louise. And I, I wanna piggyback off of what Sandra said. Um, I, when my um, child was in sixth grade, after we discovered his dyslexia in, uh, fifth grade. So um, partway through fifth grade, we placed him in a dyslexia school, a Wilson school. And after a year and a half in that school, um, he got, he was reading out loud with me and got to a word that ended in shun and went on to decode each letter to it mm -hmm. rather than seeing the morpheme shun. And so I was um, grateful that you put up Seidenberg and McClellan's connectionist model um, because of the importance of integrating and English being morphophonemic and um, the importance of meaning, so semantics and morphology in, um, in instruction for our children. And, and you can do that even at the youngest ages with S and ES and big, bigger, biggest, right? Inflectional morphology. But so often we hear, even in the speech to print world, sounds and letters, phonology and orthography, but meaning is missing. Yeah. And I really want to give a shout out to meaning. You're right. Because it's the only way to get these kids, because so many kids, especially if they come from, um, you know, literacy rich homes and schools and all of that, they, they won't present as often in the early years, but then it presents fifth grade, sixth grade and beyond because you have academic language. And I read somewhere recently that a really small number of morphemes will help you understand a great many academic words and you really need that. But we have a lot of um, homonyms as well, right? Is that the right word? <laughs> you know, 
so you have to be able, as you decode that word, you have to really quickly tie it to meaning. Right. And so um, I think it comes like a hundred milliseconds later. Um, and so, and that's part of that set to, set for variability, um, being able to, to very quickly attach what you're trying to decode to something that is meaningful. So anyway, I just wanted to say thank you for that connectionist model. We don't, we don't hear about it enough for sure. And uh, and the importance of of meaning, morphology, and semantics, and that's critical too for our English learners, exactly. our bi dialectal students, right. and our students who have developmental language disorders. It's critical. Right. But I think what's uh, I think the belief system uh, from people that haven't experienced this is that there are so many challenges, and children aren't capable of doing all of this. And when you prime the pump the right way by just re really revealing how sounds and symbols connect, phonemes and graphemes, mm -hmm. play around with sounds and words, then they and then you challenge them to play around with sounds and words themselves, then they are equipped to do that. But it does, of course, take instruction. And any program a kid could get to the word shun and read it as to it, uh, whatever. But it's the question I think that's really the thing that makes what I believe to, to be so much faster is that this speech to print speak uh, spell read is going to get kids to that morpheme shun so much quicker. And yeah, so they, but even you know, as they're decoding a you know, even simpler words, you know, to, you know, then use that word in a sentence so that they, that you, you really tie the phonology, orthography, and morphology. I think Perfetti's, uh, Charles Perfetti's research shows us the importance of that too. So yes, any case, all, but yeah, it's also you. tightly connected and we just want to give kids the quickest access so they can build mm -hmm. their vocabulary um, along while they're building their orthography. And that's great. You're, you're, you know, that research well. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Marty, can I jump in for a second? Sure. Um, I just wanted to thank you for doing such a fabulous um, overview of this topic and some of the research that you pulled in is so valuable. I can't wait to go and look at some of the things you mentioned. And I'm thinking at this point that one of the things that also jumps out at me that maybe is different about speech to print approaches that we haven't explicitly said tonight mm -hmm. is that unlike many traditional phonics programs or approaches, I would say that I, and I'm also speaking just from my experience, so please correct me if I'm wrong, that most of these approaches on your tree um, aren't teaching some of these skills to mastery the way, mm -hmm. and they're not working in a sequential, um, you know, you have to do this first, right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so there's a lot more interleaving of um, exposure and practice yeah. um, in more authentic texts that really reflect the kinds of things that kids are really reading or going to be reading. Okay, Jennifer, I'm going to make you repeat that because I'm trying to write it down, but I was agreeing with you so much that I forgot you. First, you said uh, oh, that mastery. Was there something before mastery? Well, right, that speech to print approaches aren't typically te teaching skills to mastery. Right. I think somebody recently put in the chat, they were wondering for a student with working memory challenges, isn't it going to be overload to learn different spellings of the same sound? Mm -hmm. um, and so the point isn't to master all of them at once, but to understand the concept mm -hmm. and to be exposed and then repeatedly pointed out every time they're reading a text or spelling a word, they have an opportunity to revisit that and recall that information and get it into their working memory yeah, or long-term memory, sorry. Right, that's really helpful. Um, you're right, because um, we've definitely, the, this community is trying to discuss this, the, that you're a part of, you know, definitely mastery is a big issue. And that's one of the problems that a lot of the parents that I've run across, you know, they've been, they've worked for years and they haven't gotten to long vowels. <laughs> and that kind of goes against the statistical learning that we talked about earlier. The, the written language um, includes tons of long vowels and actually only so many CVC words, you know, and um, if you look at the top 300 fry words, which makes up about 65% of written language, um, there are 47 of those 300 words that have the E sound, but there's only like a handful of four sound short vowel words and only one five sound word. So do we have to master four and five sound blending before we get into the advanced phonics? And, and even if we touch on it, do we have to master it? No, because 
they need to see the real world of print uh, earlier. Uh, and, and this, and, but we sound we sound extreme sometimes to some people because I would also start a beginner with CVC text. Um, it's just that I'm going to move more rapidly into something that has advanced phonics, and I'm going to throw some words that they have not been taught how to read at at, at them, and they're going to some of them they're going to pick up because of that self-teaching theory. It's the brain is so amazing. We don't want to put a lid on what their potential is. They can absorb more than we know. And yeah, the kids with a working memory challenge, you, they might not be able to learn all the spellings of the O sound within five days, but they might really surprise you with how many they do learn. Next, when you start back with them on Monday, you give them a little quiz, you might find, wow, they know three of those. That's pretty impressive. I wouldn't have thought that. And then if we reinforce it and cumulatively, cumulatively build on it, they're gonna pick up the remaining two quickly. And along the way, we show them how the code works. It's a code for sounds and they're gonna organize this information. It's sketchy that all the networks aren't built, but they're building pathways that are organized instead of <laughs> OA over here, ER over there. Oh, I over here, the randomness of other programs makes it extra hard. And for the people with working memory problems, it's easier for them if there's a schema. Mm -hmm. uh, Marnie, I wanted to jump in here on that, you know, the mastery versus the interleaving or spiraling or circle, circular, the make it stick book, which is a more re cognitive research on how we learn, not just reading in general, but it's an excellent book. So that's another thing that is really helpful about why it's important to do that interleaving yeah. as opposed to mastery. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. I just started reading that book because of you, Nora. And at the beginning, they talk about um, learning. We happen to learn more when we're challenged. And a lot of programs are trying to protect children from suffering so much that we don't give them challenge. And that's not how the brain learns. The brain needs to be challenged. And then also, like you said, it, if you just stick to short eye, short eye, short eye, you, you just turn your brain off. But if you have to go oh, short eye, short E, ooh, ooh, <laughs> keeps you on your toes. Yeah, yeah. thank you. That's make, make, make it stick or yeah make, yes, it stick. make it stick i'm pretty yeah. sure it's around here somewhere it's, it's been out for a while i'm, I'm sorry i missed yes. it but i've got it now on my bedside i'm only a little ways through i yeah, i recommend is, it too oopsie this is what it looks like make oopsie. it stick thank you yeah mark i forget his name but yeah there's three authors cute little pink blue book okay i think i'm gonna kind of wrap this up mm -hmm. because it's getting late any other thoughts? Um, I want to thank Marnie for this incredible presentation. You've, you've tied it all together, um, all the concepts that you brought together, and it, it really just makes it so clear of why this, this approach really works and why we need to consider it as a as a, an alternative to teaching reading. You know, there's more than two ways out there and um <laughs> it's it's a good thing to um to learn about other things let's not keep let's not be closed-minded right and there's more to explore we haven't pinned it down yet and we don't even have a name so you guys email us be in those at facebook groups keep us keep the conversation going that's right all right everyone thank you very much for thank all you so of your work, being here and all of your work okay good night everyone Good night.